Hey there, I'm Justin Blackstone and I'm a singer. Actually, I'm an opera singer. Does that scare you? Well, Adam, the guy who writes most of these stories, plays the euphonium. Watch out. Do you think classical music is for old people? Well, it is, but it's for you too. What we refer to as classical music used to be the world's favorite kind of music, and its history holds some fantastic stories. You know all that drama going on between Kanye and Taylor Swift? Some of the stuff we'll talk about makes those two look like spoiled four-year-olds. Well, they look like that anyway. We want to tell you stories about murder, intrigue, betrayal, love, loss, depression, demons, and humor. You could say that classical music portrays humanity at its absolute best and utterly worst at the same time. The pinnacle of genius atop the depravity of mankind. If any of this sounds intriguing to you, give Backstage Podcast a listen. You won't be disappointed. And for those of you who are already on the crazy classical music train, welcome. Thanks for listening, and let's get on with the show. I remember when it occurred to me that there were probably more than 50 good composers in all of music history. Bach, Mozart, and Beethoven. They couldn't possibly be the only composers that passed muster. It just didn't make any sense. I'm also reminded from time to time that composers were and are people. They suffer from jealousy, love, self-doubt, all that stuff, just like the rest of us. Maybe you remember a few months ago when Paul McCartney got rejected from Tyga's, is that how you say it? Tyga's after party following the Grammys. No one cares who Tyga is, not even the Kardashians anymore. But Sir Paul was knighted by the Queen of England. We would say that he does not need Tyga's approval. That brings us back to the whole human nature thing. We have this need to be relevant significant, and successful. Taken one step further, that obsession tries to convince us that someone else's success devalues our own. That's a lie, by the way. We're going to dig into the life of a composer who wasn't good at sharing musical successes with others. Like Paul McCartney, he also struggled to pass off the torch gracefully, and at the very end of his life, he had the dubious privilege of seeing his own popularity eclipsed. The worst part? He has faded into obscurity like the rest of those composers whom we don't remember. Nobody remembers Paisiello. This is Backstage Podcast. If you have any questions about this story or about the whole point of Backstage Podcast, send us an email at theguys at backstagepodcast.com. That's the guys at backstagepodcast.com. You can also visit our website, backstagepodcast.com, or follow us on Twitter at AskBackstage. We really do want to hear from you. For now, though, let's get started with Paisiello. By all accounts, Paisiello demonstrated musical talent from a young age. His parents were not known to be musically inclined but his voice apparently left an impression on all who heard him sing. Paisiello's version of the story states that when he was 14, the year was 1754, he participated in the choir during Holy Week services in the Italian city of Toronto. A certain Tarantine noble, Don Girolamo Carducci, was greatly moved by the young singer's voice, and he insisted that Paisiello's parents send the young Giovanni to Naples for lessons. Since studying music in Naples would require years away from home, they were understandably reluctant. They finally agreed, though, and Paisiello took only two months of preparatory music lessons before heading off for nine years of conservatory study in the artistic city of Naples. Del Corte's 1922 biography of Paisiello suggests a different version, that the young boy took an entire year of lessons from the tenor, Don Carlo Resta, before being sent to Naples. Whether it was two months or twelve, one thing remains certain. In 1754, 14-year-old Giovanni Paisiello began his nine-year stay in the conservatories of Naples. His studies progressed well, and after several regional Italian opera successes throughout his late teens and early twenties, Paisiello's first big professional break came in 1768, when he was tasked with writing two cantatas for the Neapolitan court. There was a wedding in town. The King of Naples, Ferdinando IV, was marrying Marie Theresa's daughter. It was a big deal. Janot Leland Hunt describes his success. 
These commissions attest that at 27, he had become one of the most prominent composers in Naples. According to Hunt, Paisiello had already conquered Bologna, Modena, Parma, and Venice. He was now one of the leading composers in all of Italy. 1768 wasn't just a big year for Paisiello professionally, he was also married that year. Matrimony wasn't necessarily a positive addition to his curriculum vitae, though. Composers have a way of getting into complicated relationships. Let's gain a bit of perspective. Here is a passage from De Dominicis. When Paisiello was young, he so loved the fairer sex that he was always distracted and allured on numerous occasions into amorous affairs with the ladies and the nymphs of the theater. He allowed no opportunity for a liaison to go unfulfilled. Assuming De Dominicis knew what he was talking about, we can guess that the passionate Paisiello fell into a relationship that he didn't intend to follow through with. What Paisiello didn't realize was that his newest conquest was a bit more clever than he was. Her name was Donna Cecilia Pellini, and she was his musical pupil at the time. Donna Cecilia claimed to be the widow of a recently deceased maestro of Livorno, who had left her with 1,800 ducats, which is about $1.4 million. That money would serve as a dowry if Paisiello married her, and he couldn't resist. Strangely enough, Paisiello and his father found out that Cecilia had been lying about both her marriage to Maestro Mazzini and the dowry, but it was too late. Paisiello had already agreed on legal documents to marry her. He tried as best as he could to escape. Times were different in 18th century Naples, and Paisiello had to ask the king for permission to back out of the marriage. What Paisiello may not have realized was that Cecilia, his conniving fiance, had the listening ear of the queen and the queen sided with Cecilia. In her petition to the queen, Donna Cecilia failed to mention that she had lied to Paisiello about her previous marriage and consequent dowry. She simply told the queen that she was pregnant. The plot worked, and Paisiello was detained and held in jail until he agreed to marry Cecilia. We think you should know that historical sources don't agree on this part of the story, since many accounts claim that Paisiello and his wife were childless. It appears as if either Donna Cecilia's child didn't survive, or worse, that she feigned pregnancy in the presence of the queen in order to force Paisiello into the marriage. Historian Francesco Barbario agrees with the latter. At any rate, a rather awkward start to married life ensued. After Paisiello was released from jail, he married Donna Cecilia on September 14, 1768. In late July 1776, the same month the colonies in the New World declared independence from Great Britain, Paisiello moved with Cecilia to Russia to act as Catherine the Great's court composer. Here are the words of Prince Orlov, a noble in Catherine's court, about Paisiello. It was an evening of enthusiasm. All eyes were fixed on Paisiello, a handsome 40-year-old man of noble stature, robust, dark, with two large black eyes, sweet and shining. Invited to sit at the cembalo, he started to sing his opera with an amazing smoothness and verve. At the certain moment, the empress, who had noticed a sudden paleness on the maestro's face, took the fur coat from her shoulders and was pleased to place it on the fortunate shoulders of him who enchanted her so much. You may have noticed from the above quote that Catherine the Great had a special place in her heart for Paisiello, and there has been plenty of speculation about whether or not an affair was at play. Historians imply that Paisiello's unfortunate and awkward marriage left room for extracurriculars. Affair or not, after six years in the Russian court, Paisiello found himself contracted to compose operas at an alarming rate. Due to the small amount of time he could devote to each opera, Paisiello had to search for pre-existing librettos. His search for librettos led him to the works of the famous playwright Beaumarchais, and he ultimately asked for a translation of a Beaumarchais play that modern opera-going crowds will recognize, Il Barbier di Seville. In 1782, Paisiello debuted what would become one of the most famous operas in history. He certainly couldn't have imagined the rest of the story, though. And now we get to the part of the show where we hear some emails from our listeners. Adam, take it away. All right. So uh, writing in from Detroit, Michigan, we have Clayton or Clayton. I don't know. Whatever. Clayton said, 
Once I had to wear matching purple pajama pants with my roommate for an opera production. <laughs> Obviously, the cashier at Walmart thought something was going on. Dot, dot, dot. Seriously, though, guys, this is fantastic. All right, Justin. Uh, so what's fantastic? The pajama pants? Walmart? The cashier? Uh, well, I think... All, all of the above, uh, but I, I really hope that he thinks the podcast is fantastic. Thanks for listening, Clayton. Um, that was quite an interesting story. We all know that what happens in opera rehearsal stays in opera rehearsal. Um, but it sounds like that that uh, the cashier was concerned that two grown men were buying women's purple pajama pants. But yeah, times have changed. You know, <laughs> if you have a story about your own purple pajama pants or anything else, write us in at the guys at backstagepodcast.com. If this has shown you anything, it has shown you that we will actually read your email. So go ahead and send it in. We'll read it out loud to thousands of people. We would love to hear from you. And don't just send in your crazy music stories. Uh, send us in some story ideas. Maybe you're, you know, you have a subject that you really want to hear us talk about on the podcast. Send them in, and, and you know, we'll definitely read them and, and take a look. We're always looking for new and exciting stories to do. Uh, we'll we'll hear some more uh, email listeners uh, next week, um, and we'll probably put some more emails up on the website if you want to read some more emails that we didn't have time to read on the show today. All right, let's get back to that story. Let's do it. In many performance-based sports or genres, the latest competitors often outdo their predecessors. Steph Curry shoots the rock better than Larry Bird and Ray Allen. Michael Phelps eventually outswam Ian Thorpe. This isn't always or often because modern performers are inherently more talented or skilled. The propensity to outperform predecessors is because modern figures can stand on the shoulders of those who have gone before. Examples are a powerful point of reference. With one, you can see where your mark lies and shoot for it. Years after The Barber of Seville was written, Rossini described Paisiello this way, He was uneducated and immeasurably insignificant. The shallowness of his ideas cannot be imagined. Not only is this a blatantly ignorant quote, Paisiello was a highly accomplished composer in his own right, but it reflects the competitive attitude within classical music. It's the kind of competitiveness that won't allow colleagues to respect each other, and it's not at all healthy. Truth be told, Rossini's Barber of Seville probably wouldn't have succeeded without Paisiello's. Rossini needed a point of reference to make his different, but without getting into the barber too deeply, let's step back into Rossini's life. Rossini was born on February 29, 1792, into a poor family. His parents, who struggled to remain together, struggled even harder to find enough work to support the family. Rossini's father was the town trumpeter, his mother an untrained but talented soprano. The first 20 years of Rossini's life were spent amid Napoleon's tumultuous relationship with Europe. In spite of his poor behavior in school settings and a series of apprenticeships, including a stint with both a butcher and a blacksmith, Rossini wrote his first stage work at the age of 18. The audience loved it, and he was awarded a fully commissioned work the next year, in 1811. The timing couldn't have been better. Mozart mania was just beginning in Italy. It took a long time for many Italians to believe that a non-Italian could write music. And in 1815, La Scala performed Mozart's Marriage of Figaro. Rossini, who idolized Mozart, created his depiction of Figaro in The Barber of Seville the following year. It is also important to remember that Napoleon's conquest had influenced all of Italy by this point. Many Italians that had initially viewed him as a liberator had finally come to view him as a self-serving menace. The French conquest of Italy began in 1796 and effectively ended in 1812. Since they had been under the domination of the Habsburg Austrian rulers, many Italians thought Napoleonic domination would mean greater freedom from upper-class control. After all, hadn't the French Revolution gone so well? Things didn't exactly go as planned for the Italians, though. Once he had defeated Italy in 1796, Napoleon owned the right to conscript Italians into his army, and that was a right he exercised prior to 1812, which you may remember as the year that the French army tried and failed to conquer Russia. 
Napoleon's 680,000 man army that entered Russia left with only 27,000 men. 30,000 men in that doomed army were Italian. A Milan-based French general had heard of one of Rossini's operas and requested that Rossini be exempted from military service prior to the Russian campaign. In other words, it is likely that the world almost lost Rossini to military service at the age of 20, four years before The Barber of Seville was written. By 1815, the young Giacchino Rossini was an active composer, and in the same year, the Teatro di Argentina needed a new commission, and fast. Giacchino Rossini was hired to quickly write an opera, and per usual custom, the empresario of the opera house provided the libretto. Because of the time crunch, the empresario resorted to a tried and true text that was already written, Beaumarchais' The Barber of Seville. Couple of quick notes. First, the Teatro de Argentina is actually in Rome, not Argentina. Also, we have an article on the website about Beaumarchais. We think you'll like it, and it gives some interesting background to the Barber of Seville. Rossini immediately noticed the professional peril of writing an opera that looked to be indirectly in competition with Paisiello's opera of the same name, and a letter was sent off to Paisiello at Rossini's behest. Amid a flurry of compliments and flattery, Rossini and the empresario tried to placate the popular Paisiello by explaining that the opera was entirely different from his, and that they would call the opera Almaviva instead of The Barber of Seville. Here's a bit from Warren Roberts' account, quoting the preface of the original Barber libretto. The comedy by Signor Beaumarchais, entitled The Barber of Seville, or The Futile Precaution, is being presented in Rome, adapted as a drama comico under the title of Alma Viva, or The Futile Precaution. This for the purpose of convincing the public fully of the sentiments of respect and veneration which animate the creator of the music of the present drama toward the greatly celebrated Paisiello, who dealt with the subject under the original title. It also bears mentioning that Paisiello didn't have a reputation for getting along with other composers. Warren Roberts puts it this way, He established a reputation as a composer to be reckoned with, but he was touchy and difficult, and he was resentful of fellow Neapolitan composers Niccolo Piccini, Domenico Cimarosa, and Pietro Guglielmi. Paisiello responded to Rossini's opera with professional grace, although the pretentious undertones in his response are hard to miss. Many scholars even believe his letter was a front, that he wasn't in fact as cordial as he tried to sound. You should know that this was a time when papal police were carefully censoring artistic material that they thought held allusions to political dissent or unacceptable lifestyles. This was also an era where Leo XIII was instructing that artists cover up sculptures with fig leaves. They even clothed some pre-existing sculptures by Michelangelo. Anyways. Paisiello made sure to include a line about the good taste of the papal police when he learned that they would allow the use of the Barber of Seville. Many sources claim that Paisiello thought the opera would be a flop. Rossini's contract for the opera was signed late in 1815, and he had two months to write Almaviva. As if two months weren't already short enough, he claims to have written it in 13 days. Before we tell you how the opening performance of the opera went, and boy was it a doozy. There's some more history that you need to understand. Late 18th century opera audiences weren't as civil as they are now. Today's worst offenders open cough drops or forget to wear deodorant, and probably try to catch Pokemon during concerts. Nobody cared about deodorant or Pokemon in the 18th century, so their misbehavior took other forms. Modern performers don't have to worry about angry crowds booing, shouting, and heckling them throughout a performance nor must they fear angry mobs forming in the streets afterwards. These were all common offenses during this time period, thanks to a phenomenon known as the clack. We recommend that you do some further clack reading to really understand what happened during Almaviva's opening night, but here's the gist of a clack. A group of people would show up to a performance with the intent of ruining it or shaming the composer. They would boo, catcall, and generally disrupt the performers. They were even sometimes paid by a rival party to do so. Such is the historical backdrop for the opening of Almaviva. On February 20th, 1816, Rossini and his cast took the stage, and mayhem ensued. 
Encyclopedia Britannica suggests that the performers were already underprepared for the performance, seeing as they had such little time to prepare. Unprepared or not, they likely weren't prepared for the antics of the audience. A clack loyal to Paisiello showed up. The audience, who may have either been paid by a Paisiello supporter to disrupt the performance, or may have shown up out of their own free will, jeered and shouted, and nothing was left off limits. The man who had commissioned the opera, and wanted to hear it so badly, Duke Francesco Sforza Cesarini, had died two weeks before the premiere, and the crowd shouted, Here we are at the funeral of Duke Cesarini! Rossini had been paid in both currency and a new leather jacket with gold buttons. This he wore to the opening night's performance. The crowd saw that jacket, and started to make fun of it endlessly. According to some accounts, the audience finished the performance by chanting Paisiello's name loudly as the curtain closed. Needless to say, Rossini wasn't interested in showing his face at the next performance. Since it was in the composer's contracts to perform at the keyboard during an opera, Rossini feigned sickness to avoid the second performance. He paced his rooms nervously, afraid that the second night would be a complete failure as well. He also forced famous singer Manuel Garcia, who was paid more for Almaviva than Rossini was, to ditch the suitcase aria that he had brought, and gave him an aria to sing that actually had something to do with the plot. Here's one last aside. A suitcase aria was when a singer decided to sing an aria from a different opera other than the present one to show off his or her vocal prowess. It would be like busting out the theme song from The Lion King in the middle of a tender moment in Phantom of the Opera. We'll include a little bit more supplemental information about suitcase arias on the website as well. To Rossini's horror, a crowd formed in the street and started towards his rooms after the performance. The people were rowdy and shouting. What he couldn't initially tell, though, was that the crowd was shouting, Bravo! Bravissimo Figaro! However, it was too late for Rome to win over Rossini's heart, and he refused to come outside. Even the hotel manager and Manuel Garcia tried to get him to acknowledge the crowd, most likely because they were afraid of what the ignored mob might do. But all they got out of the grumpy composer was, and we're going to lightly censor this here, screw their bravos, I'm not coming out. It goes without saying that Rossini's Almaviva became a hit. It may be the most recognizable opera of all time. Later on, when professional politics no longer mattered, the name was changed to The Barber of Seville, and that has endured ever since. In 1825, it became the first opera to be sung in Italian in the United States. It was performed at the Park Theater in New York. Paisiello died on June 5, 1816, less than four months after the premiere of Rossini's Almaviva, but not before he realized that it was being played all over the world. After a lifetime of climbing to the top and standing upon other shoulders, Paisiello lived just long enough to see his own fame eclipsed. Let's look ahead to next week's story. I think Adam has some details for us. We've got a spicy one. It is brought to you by Satan. Whoa. Um, So Giuseppe Tartini, the famous Italian composer and violinist, was around in the 1700s, a time when most composers, I I think we can say most composers, were attributing their works to God. He was getting his inspiration from the devil. So... Things are going to get a little bit different. Wow, sounds great. I hope you can all be here to listen to next week's uh, episode brought to you by Satan. But, you know, not really. It's just us. The guys. It's, It's still us, I promise. Yep. Well, until next time, this has been Backstage Podcast. Backstage this week was written by Adam Gingry and narrated by Justin Blackstone. But as always, it's more of a team effort. Music for the show was provided by Viking. That's V-Y-K-I-N-G. Check them out on SoundCloud. Original artwork for this episode by Vivian Morris. Yeah, definitely take the time to check out her depiction of the clack at Rossini's premiere concert on our website. And don't forget to subscribe to our weekly comic. You don't want to miss it. Thanks for listening to today's episode. 
We enjoyed researching and putting together this great story, and we hope you enjoyed listening to it. Please subscribe to the show on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts. When you subscribe, leave us a five-star rating if you enjoyed the show. Like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at Ask Backstage. Don't forget to email us your favorite classical music stories, past or present, to theguys at backstagepodcast.com. Also, with each podcast, we are going to put up a corresponding blog post with images and more information that we couldn't fit into the show. We also have links to listen to both versions of The Barber of Seville so that you can decide which one is better. If you enjoyed the episode, you will definitely want to check it out. You can find more articles and episodes as well as all of the above at our website, www.backstagepodcast.com. See you next time.